share screen. There we go. All right. Um, welcome everyone to our presentation on oral health and scleroderma. We're calling this meeting, our, this talk, what your dentist and your physician want to know about scleroderma and oral health 2021. I'm joined by my colleague, Louis, Dr. Luis Del Castillo. We taught together for many years at Tufts University, and now he is a professor at Henry M. Goldman School of Dentistry at Boston University. Hey, everybody. I'm sorry? I was just saying hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> and uh, here's uh, pictures of our schools. Tufts University is in Chinatown in Boston, and uh, Boston University is just almost exactly a mile away in, is it South Boston? It's uh, South End. South End. South End. I'm actually speaking to you from my home in Gloucester. So here's a map of Massachusetts and you can see Tufts Dental Center is, Tufts Medical Center is in downtown Boston and Gloucester is uh, about 40 miles north of there. On, on a little spit of land called Cape Ann. This is what I'm seeing behind my computer screen right now. This is the view out the front of my house and that's the Anaswam River, which separates Cape Ann from the rest of the world. Dr. Del Casillo. Uh, I'm originally from Caracas, Venezuela. And that's a picture of Caracas. I came to the United States in 1996, actually to Boston, to Tufts University in 1996 to do a uh, postgraduate program in prosthodontics. So I'm a uh, prosthodontist uh, by profession. And prosthodontist is a specialty in dentistry that deals with crowns, bridges, dentures, and all types of uh, restorations. Um, came initially in 96, uh, finished the program in 99, then I taught in the school for one year. Went back home in 2000 and in December of 2002, the school asked me to come back. So I came back in 03. Currently, you can go to the next slide, please. please. Um, I practice in downtown Boston. That's a picture of my office, Beacon Hill Dental Associates. That's the address and phone number and the website, if you're interested. It's a build them in the middle. And uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, there's a map of where the um, office is. The office is located in downtown Boston, right in front of the uh, Boston Public Garden, very close to the Boston Commons. It's a very beautiful area to visit. So if you're ever in Boston, and um, this is a very touristy scene, I mean, this is a sight to see in Boston. And uh, actually I have the um, Cheers Bar, it's four doors down from my office. So um, also another uh, you know tourist spot to visit in Boston. So more than welcome to see if you wanna come to Boston. And your office is beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so what do your dentist and your rheumatologist and other physicians wanna know about uh, scleroderma and rural health? First of all, I want to point out that it's really important for your healthcare providers to work as a team. And uh, here's a picture of me a few years ago uh, when my hair was a little bit darker it, at a patient education seminar in Peabody, Massachusetts, which is uh, in between where I live in Boston. And you can see I'm sitting with uh, 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 Dr. Sims, who is a rheumatologist and um, used to run the scleroderma program at Boston University. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Philip Clements, another rheumatologist. Dr. Plout is a gastroenterologist at Tufts University and Dr. Harrison Farber. And Dr. Carol Figali Bostwick, who does a lot of basic science research in scleroderma. It's so important for all of us to speak together to be able to provide your best care. And one thing that I forgot to mention, Dave, sorry to interrupt you, is that um, not only I'm a dentist also, but I also have scleroderma. And uh, I had a, uh, in July, this July is gonna be three years since I had a double lung transplant. So um, I know what you, uh, you as a patient are, uh, is going, are going through. And um, so that I, you know, I, I know how it feels. 
And um, let's see. So uh, what does your team want to know about you and scleroderma? Well, the medical team is going to need to know what your health, oral health issues are and how does a non-dentist recognize these problems? What can medical healthcare professionals do to improve oral health? How do I refer a scleroderma patient to a dentist and which dentist? And also it's important for your medical providers to write a letter to your medical insurance to see if you can get coverage for oral health care treatment as a medical issue. The, um, I have uh, on file a letter from, a, uh, from Dr. Frick in uh, Utah. She wrote a wonderful letter, but it's about five, six years old now. I know that uh, one of my rheumatologist colleagues is working on a new updated letter. And if anyone needs such a thing, I welcome you to email me to ask for it. And as soon as I have it, I will send it to you. Now, the dental team, I just wanna point out that for dental school and for medical school, we learn about a lot of diseases and conditions and it's possible to get through medical school and dental school having learned very little about scleroderma. So it's important for the providers to be open to hearing the information that uh, the Scleroderma Foundation and others can provide to them. And often uh, patients are able to bring this information in. So dentists, we're going to need to know what are your oral health issues and how does scleroderma affect not just your oral health, but your systemic health? Because we are providing you with treatments and with, uh, and uh, we're providing you with treatments and with medications. We need to know what medications you take, who your physicians are, how can oral health providers work with the medical team? How does scleroderma affect dental implant treatment and orthodontics? And dentists do know dental insurance well, but we really don't know anything about medical insurance and can't help you there. And let me talk a little bit about the, um, what are the common dental findings? that we see not only in scleroderma patients, but in any patient in general. Um, some of you may know that a dental plaque is usually what causes the decay. The dental plaque actually can work two different ways. One of the ways is creating, causing decay, as you see in the pictures. So on um, picture number one, you see a, a, an image of a healthy tooth. They might have a little bit of plaque on it, but there's no um, actual cavity on it. Then on number two, you can see a little bit of a shadow on the top portion of the tooth and a little bit in between each of the two teeth. And that's the beginning of decay there. So that's decay or cavity in the enamel. The enamel is the outer portion of the tooth is what you can actually see in your mouth. And at this point, treating this decay, you don't necessarily need to be numbed. You don't need anesthesia to treat these types of decay. Sometimes when we see it, especially in between the teeth, when it's not that we can find those on x-rays, but when it doesn't go too far in, we usually monitor them because we have to drill a lot of tooth structure, sound tooth structure to get to them. And it may not progress any further than what it is. So sometimes we watch those type of lesions. But the point is that at this type of lesion at this stage on image number two, you can have the filling done with no anesthesia, you're not gonna feel anything. Then on picture number three, you see a decay in dentin. Dentin is the next layer underneath the enamel. And when the decay reaches the dentin is when you start to feel pain. It's sensitive to um, usually cold or um, sweets. So and that's when your teeth starts to respond to these type of lesions. You definitely need to be numb to treat this type of decay. And then the next uh, picture, number four, decay in the pulp. The pulp is that what you see in red inside the tooth, and that's where the nerve resides. Inside that chamber, we have nerves and we have blood vessels too. 
So when the decay reaches that area, usually the nerve dies. You're gonna have pain in these situations, especially when an abscess is starting to form, which you can see in one of the roots that shows like a little bit of a bubble there. So that's an abscess starting to form. And um, these are, uh, this situation requires a root canal for this particular tooth. So not every time you have pain doesn't necessarily mean that you need a root canal, but this situation on picture number four, you're gonna have pain to hot and cold you're going to have lingering pain. You need to take any type of uh, painkillers. It, it may wake you up at night. So those type of symptoms usually indicate the need for a root canal. And when you need, you, when you need a root canal, it's because the decay reached already all the way to the pulp. And let's go to the next slide, please. Now, the other way that the plaque can attack the tooth and the plaque, I, I forgot to mention, is a sticky colorless and pale yellow film that is constantly forming on your teeth. When saliva, food, and fluids combine and the plaque has bacteria, it forms in your teeth and along the gum line. So one way of the plaque to attack the teeth is causing decay. And the other um, way of the plaque to attack is, is causing um, uh, gum disease, or periodontal disease or gum disease. So again, picture number one, you see a healthy uh, condition. Picture number two, you see gingivitis. And you can see a little bit of a yellowish um, stain around the teeth. And that's the plaque that accumulates in between the teeth. And then it picks up uh, calcium ions from the saliva and it calcifies. So it becomes like a, like a rock. And that rock has rough surfaces and irritates the gums. So when you have gingivitis, you usually have bleeding gums. And then uh, the next slide number, um, image number three, sorry, you still have the gingivitis, but now it's have, you have pockets. So what's happening here is that there, the gum starts to recede. You start to lose a little bit of the bone and there's spaces between the gums and the teeth. Those are called pockets. And then the next slide, the next, sorry, image, image number four, you, you can see periodontitis. So periodontitis is a more, a more advanced type of gingivitis where not only you have inflammation of the gums, but you also have bone loss. And you can see how the bone, which is the, the pinkish um, image, the color that you see in between the teeth on slide number four is much more lower compared to picture number one. And, uh, and you can see that the stain around the teeth is now darker because it's a much more you know, aged uh, type of buildup on the teeth. So that's why it's important for you to see your hygienist and see your dentist regularly to keep this uh, buildup from forming. Or if it forms too quickly, then you may have to visit your dentist sooner. And usually people that have uh, gum disease don't have decay. And people that have decay don't have gum disease. So sometimes it comes to a surprise for a patient that you know, when we reach the periodontitis stage, teeth usually cannot be saved and have to be extracted. So sometimes it comes to surprise of patients that, you know, you, you're telling me, doctor, you're telling me that you need to extract my tooth. I never had a cavity, but it's not because of a cavity. It's because of the, the gum disease and the bone not holding the tooth any longer. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've talked about how uh, your oral health can be affected by plaque. Now let's talk about how scleroderma and oral health interact. So people who have scleroderma, about 70% end up having dry mouth or xerostomia. And uh, you might've also heard the term Sjogren's syndrome or, uh, um, or a secondary Sjogren's syndrome. Scleroderma can affect the bone in the teeth, causing osteolysis and resorption. Uh, so bone resorption, um, where the bone is actually eaten away from around the teeth, can cause pain and difficulty opening, and sclerodactyly, where it's hard to use your hands. Then there can be oral effects of medication. So some of the medications that you take can affect your oral health. 
And then of course, there's the psychological effects of having a chronic illness, which can affect your ability to take care of your activities of daily living, including brushing and flossing and going to the dentist. And finally, uh, many people who have scleroderma also have difficulty with gastroesophageal reflux disease. So we're going to talk about, uh, Dr. Del Casillo and I are gonna talk about many of these issues right now. First of all, Back when I was in dental school, I learned about this in 1981 or 82, we learned that dentists are able to diagnose scleroderma based on findings in a dental x-ray. Now, this dental x-ray is from one of my patients. I have the patient's permission to use this radiograph, but the information I'm talking about was in a textbook the Synopsis of Oral Pathology by Baskar, which was published in 1981. So widening of the periodontal ligament, and here's an enlargement of that, around many of the teeth indicates that the patient has scleroderma. The interesting thing about this is it could make your teeth feel a little wobbly, a little loose. And some dentists who don't remember this one sentence from dental school may believe that it's gum disease that's causing this issue. So it's important if you have scleroderma to figure out whether your loose teeth are being caused by osteolysis or by widening of the periodontal ligament space like in this image or by periodontal disease. Also something interesting, this uh, there was a study published in Canada a few years ago, the Canadian Systemic Sclerosis Oral Health Study v. Relationship Between Disease Characteristics and Oral Radiographic Findings and Systemic Sclerosis. And what they found was the more widening of the PDL a patient has, the more likely they are to have um, a more difficult case of scleroderma. Having a, an autoimmune disease, especially one like scleroderma, makes you more at risk for tooth decay. So you would be classified as a high-risk patient and you should be treated as a high-risk patient, meaning that you would need more frequent dental x-rays. Your dentist should be seeing you more frequently for checkups and cleaning. And also your dentist or your physician should be prescribing stronger fluoride toothpaste for you. And I, on this slide, I just have the list of uh, risk factors for uh, having high risk for tooth decay. So now when we get to xerostomia or dry mouth, there are some treatments available for dry mouth. Unfortunately, there is not a cure for this condition. The, uh, the treatments are symptomatic. We, if your mouth is dry, we try and make your mouth more moist. We can do that using mouth rinses like Cafasol, which is a super saturated calcium phosphate rinse, which helps remineralize teeth. We can also use artificial saliva, some of which are by prescription only and some of which you can buy over the counter, but this would be uh, products like Salivart, Oasis, Biotene Rinse, by the way, I don't have any sort of financial agreements with any of these companies or with any uh, product that I might mention. Sugar-free candies, of course, fluoride, and we can prescribe a muscarinic agonist, a medication to trick your salivary glands into creating more saliva. And there's two that are very common. One is called Salagen, which actually was developed at Tufts by one of my mentors. Uh, Dr. Athena Pappas, and the other one is EvoSac. Here are some fluoride products that uh, you may be aware of or your dentist will know. GelCam is a fluoride gel that you apply to your teeth and leave on your teeth for a period of time. Many dentists will prescribe this with a, uh, a mouth guard that fits over your teeth and it's just like giving yourself uh, a fluoride treatment every day like when you were a child. Also, we can prescribe Prevident 5000 Plus 
or a generic that's similar to that. This is a toothpaste just like the toothpaste you would buy over the counter, except that it has three times the concentration of fluoride, making it a little more effective. You do want to keep these products away from children or children should use them only under close supervision of an adult. We can apply fluoride varnish in the dental office. I recommend that patients have this done when they come to the dental office to have their teeth cleaned by the dentist or by a dental hygienist. Also, we can use a product called silver diamine fluoride. I have this video. I'm going to skip through parts of the video just so that you can see certain things. Oh, and the video isn't running. So the, uh, what the video shows is this is a, um, an almost clear liquid. We use a very tiny amount. We paint it on the teeth. It's very staining. It will stain clothes. It will stain, uh, it will temporarily stain gum tissue. It will temporarily stain your lips if you get it on your lips. So it's important that the dentist who is applying this uh, silver diamine fluoride be very careful. It is very good at arresting tooth decay. So if you are not able to get tooth decay treated immediately for whatever reason, or in some cases, if you have tooth decay under a bridge and we can't treat the tooth decay under the bridge, we can arrest the tooth decay and at least buy some time until we figure out how to treat it. This just gets painted on the tooth and then um, rinsed away and then maybe painted again. And then another week or two later, painted again any place where you have tooth decay, it will turn the decay black. That black will not go away, but the stain on the tissue will. I do want to mention oral effects of medication. So many of the medications that you could be taking to treat scleroderma and other conditions can cause oral health issues. There are over 400 medications that cause dry mouth. If you have scleroderma and you're also taking a medication that causes dry mouth, then your dry mouth may be severe. There are medication, oh, those medications can be very simple medications like um, antihistamines or decongestants. Gingival hyperplasia is caused by medications such as calcium channel blockers. What this means is your gum tissue actually thickens. It grows bigger. If you're taking a calcium channel blocker like nifedipine, which is very common in scleroderma, your gums may swell. And if you do a good job brushing and flossing, it will reduce the amount of swelling, but it may not completely stop it. And the treatment for this growth in your gums is to have it trimmed away. There are medications that can cause mouth sores, oral lesions. There are medications that can irritate the lining of your mouth. There are medications that can cause you to get a fungal infection called candidiasis. This is especially common if you have dry mouth. There are over 60 medications that cause a change in taste or dysgeusia. And these can affect your taste by either uh, affecting the taste buds directly or the nerves that go to the taste buds. It can be, a, the medication can end up in your saliva where you taste it. And um, of course, having dry mouth affects your ability to taste. Then there are medications that can cause osteonecrosis or bone death of the jaw. We've heard a lot in, um, in um, common news, in public news about medications called bisphosphonates, which you take to reduce bone loss. So many people who have scleroderma are taking medications such as uh, uh, Fosamax and Deedronel. If you're taking these medications, 
they make you more likely to have this osteonecrosis or uncomfortable bone death of the jaw. If you do a good job taking care of your oral health, re uh, reducing your periodontal disease, reducing tooth decay, reducing other oral infections, then you are much less likely to have this problem with osteonecrosis of the jaw. Just briefly about these medications that we can prescribe to uh, increase your saliva. So a dentist or a physician can prescribe Evosac or Salogen. It's interesting that even though you have dry mouth from an autoimmune disease, your salivary glands may still have the ability to produce saliva and yet don't. So these medications trick the nerves that are going to the, uh, to the salivary glands to just make more saliva. We do have to be careful about prescribing these medications. And if your dentist is prescribing it, you may have to contact your physician. So we don't want to prescribe this medication or prescribe it very carefully with a lot of observation to people who have uncontrolled asthma, to people who are allergic to the medication, to people who have acute iritis, which is an eye condition, or acute narrow, or I'm sorry, people who have narrow angle glaucoma. So glaucoma is the increase in pressure in your eyes, and this can raise the pressure more. Salogen or Evosac, one of my students who graduated from Tufts a couple of years ago and is actually returning July 1st for an oral surgery residency is Craig Holliday. Uh, he has a, uh, a famous great, great grand uncle, uh, Dr. John Holliday or Doc Holliday. He did a very nice uh, study a, uh, a study of patients' records who took pilocarpine or uh, salogen versus sevamelin or Evosac. And what he found was that people who took uh, pilocarpine or sevamelin both had improvements, but it seemed that people who took pilocarpine or salogen had more side effects. After looking at his paper, which was a brilliant paper and very well done, something that I noticed is the patients who uh, took uh, Salogen may have started taking Salogen many years ago. And Sevamelin is a newer medication. So when you compare people taking Salogen to people taking uh, Evosac, you find that the people taking Salogen on average have more side effects, but they were taking different medications for scleroderma, which may have also had more side effects. So you really can't compare the two. One thing that I will say is Salogen is far less expensive than Sevamelin or, or Evosac. I recommend starting patients on Salogen, see how they do. If they see an improvement, which by the way, the improvement for on either of these medications takes up to three months and it takes about six weeks to notice any improvement. So you have to be patient. But if you take, if you start out taking Salogen and find that there's either no improvement or you're having some of the side effects that are disconcerting like drooling too much then you might want to try the other medication, Evosac. Oh, it's such a long paper. So many slides. There we go. Dr. Del Castillo. All right, so let's talk a little bit about GERD right now. <clears throat> As you know, GERD, or gastroesophageal um, reflux disease, is <clears throat> a condition where the acid from the stomach goes up to the esophagus and ends up being in the mouth. Uh, you can see in this picture uh, all the enamel that is missing, especially on the molar teeth. And um, sometimes patients don't even know that they have GERD. 
it, it happened to me, my condition, uh, before I was even diagnosed with scleroderma, I, I was already diagnosed with GERD. So these conditions have to be treated very aggressively. Uh, you have to coordinate with your medical and dental team to work together. And by treating aggressively, meaning that for instance, for, instance, for this particular patient, I had to do crowns on all of these patients' back teeth, where you know, in some situations, maybe a simple filling will do. We have to be more aggressive and treat the whole tooth because we could do just a simple filling, a small filling in one tooth, but then if the GERD continues, it's just gonna erode the rest of the tooth. So we have to you know, uh, work a little bit more aggressively in, in terms of the teeth. You also have to be on a proton pump inhibitor like a Prilosec, which is not going to reduce the amount of acid in your stomach. What it's going to do is gonna reduce the acidity of the acid in your stomach. Uh, you have to change your diet too. You try to avoid any caffeine uh, or um, uh, chocolates too. They asked me to stop the chocolates, which is some people it's a little bit hard, including myself. And um, a low acid diet. Uh, another thing is also, if you, go, you can go to the next slide. Uh, raise the head of your bed or use an, uh, a wedge pillow or an adjustable bed. Because when we have scleroderma, one of the reasons we got GERD is that our esophagus is also affected, like in my case. And what happens is that the sphincter that closes between the esophagus and the stomach is relaxed. Normally that sphincter is closed, so it prevents any acid from flowing up to your esophagus. You can go to the next slide. So as you can see on the upper left corner is a picture of a normal esophagus. So what you see there in yellowish green inside the stomach that is representing the acid in your stomach. And you can see the lining of the esophagus inside is nice pink and the sphincter is really closed. So there's no leakage of the uh, acid content of the, of the stomach into your esophagus. Now with scleroderma, that sphincter is relaxed, so it opens up. So it's very easy for the acid content to flow up into your esophagus. Not only that happens, but also the motility of the esophagus, meaning the way the esophagus works. The esophagus is like a muscle. It's essentially it's a muscle. And when you eat, that muscle pushes the food down to your stomach. So that's called a peristaltic movement. And for people that have scleroderma, that peristaltic movement is usually reduced. So that you know, motion of the esophagus pushing this food down to your stomach is reduced. It's not as effective as it used to be. So the fact of the acid content going up and the esophagus being impaired in terms of bringing your food down to your stomach creates a problem if on getting um, uh, reflux. It's very easy to get reflux. And when you're laying horizontal, is also very common for the acid content to go up to your esophagus. And the lining of the esophagus is not made to have that very acidic content. So when that sphincter is reduced, is, re is uh, relaxed and the content of the stomach goes up to the esophagus, it irritates those tissues. And those tissues are not used to having that type of content in them. So that's why you see the red, it looks like reddish and, and bleeding and, and that's what's called Barrett's esophagus. So you have to check with your doctor and make sure that you get a uh, endoscopy and make sure that rule out any Barrett's esophagus because Barrett's esophagus is a condition that could become very serious. Could, you could get cancer from that. I'm not saying that if you have Barrett's esophagus, you have it, but it's, 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 it's a precondition. So make sure that you have your, your doctor check and do an endoscopy and make sure that you don't have Barrett's esophagus. You can go to the next slide, Dave, please. And so it happened to me that I had an episode of aspiration uh, because of that, you know, impair of the esophagus. And uh, I got reflux one day late at night. I ended up in the hospital with uh, aspiration pneumonia. And ever since then, I started sleeping 
in the slant. So I started using a wedge pillow and then eventually I bought a, an adjustable bed. I strongly recommend you get this. And now I'm used to sleeping at a slant. Uh, we bought um, individual uh, adjustable beds so I can sleep at a slant and my wife can sleep horizontally without any problems. It, you don't necessarily have to get the type of bed that you see in the picture. You can get them individually if you want. Um, but it, I, if you have GERD, I strongly recommend that you get uh, an adjustable bed or a wet pillow. Make sure you don't sleep horizontal because um, having an aspiration, pneumonia is gonna affect your uh, lungs and um, it's gonna create even more problems. If you know, already know that scleroderma mechanism can cause problems in the lungs. I ended up, like I mentioned before, I ended up having a double lung transplant almost three years ago. And um, so this is gonna prevent you from getting up to that, that uh, point. I have uh, just one thing to add. Yes. Uh, Dr. Del Casillo. Um, I've heard some uh, gastroenterologists recommend that rather than using a wedge pillow, which they feel the patient may roll off of the wedge pillow at night and then not have a pillow, uh, they recommend putting six to eight inches of books or wood or pavers under the feet at the head of the bed to tilt the whole bed up. So that's a, a fairly simple, inexpensive way yes. to tilt the entire bed. Yes, yeah, absolutely. The wedge pillow works, uh, but like, like, like you said, you, know, you end up sliding down the pillow. So that's why the adjustable bed, I think, is better especially the ones that you can raise your leg, because once you raise your leg, you're wedged in there, so you're not going to move. Okay. Now, uh, microstomia, this is uh, another very common condition, and that for us dentists, it, it creates a challenge. Uh, this is a scleroderma patient that we had, I had permission to use this picture for the presentation. And even if you see that the patient seems to be opening the mouth really well, you can barely fit two fingers in this patient's mouth. So it creates a challenge for us because we have instruments that we have to try to fit inside your mouth. And if you have a small mouth opening, it, it's very difficult for us to treat. Um, so that's why when you see your dentist, um, you have to be, your dentist have to be very patient with your case and you have to be also very patient with your dentist because we, it's, it's very difficult for us to treat patients like this, especially if we treat them way in the back of the mouth. Not only because the mouth cannot open too much, but also the cheeks don't, doesn't stretch. So it's, it's very, very hard for us to, um, to treat um, these conditions. You can go to the next slide, please. please. Um, so like I said, microstomia is a small mouth opening and scleroid actually is a tightening of your fingers. Thankfully, I don't have much scleroid actually. In my case, it's where I'm affected initially was my lungs and my esophagus, but not much of a skin involvement. And um, here you have a link of the um, exercises for uh, uh, hands and mouth on the Scleroid Foundation website. And it, it has a lot of good information there. There's plenty of information for you to find and you can see there exercises for your hands and your, and your, uh, your mouth. So very, very good uh, source of information to um, look into. Um, so like I said, phys physical therapy, like I mentioned on the, that you can see on the, uh, on the link. Another procedure that the, another surgeon can do is called the uh, commissurotomy which is a procedure where the oral surgeon cuts the corners of your mouth and situates a little bit further. So that will help you open up a little bit more. Um, I would consider this if uh, everything else fails or if it's really, really hard to treat your mouth, then this is something that is probably good to consider. Now for us, we have to be really very patient with you. Uh, we use, drills, hand pieces to treat your teeth. And those have a certain size. So sometimes we need to modify the burrs or the, the drill bits that we use on these drills to make them smaller. 
or uh, so be able to get all the way in the back of your mouth. The other thing that we have we can do is we can use pediatric equipment. On this picture on the right, the lower picture, uh, I mean, the lower uh, right side, you see a normal head of a normal handpiece, and on the left is a pediatric handpiece. So I, I specially ordered pediatric handpieces to be able to treat scleroderma patients. I've been lucky enough to have Dr. Lieber refer scleroderma patients to my office, and I have patients from the one that you just saw who can barely open their mouth to patients that you can never really tell that they have scleroderma. So I have the whole you know, spectrum of the disease, uh, but the people that cannot really open their mouth, we have to find ways to uh, help us in treating you. Another um, uh, item that we use are mouth props that is gonna help you uh, keep your mouth open like you see in those pictures that come in different sizes. So depending on how much can you open your mouth, we can put it there. Because not only is it difficult for you to open your mouth, but sometimes your jaw gets tired too for being open for so long. And um, another thing that um, makes it hard for us to treat scleroderma patients, especially the ones that have GERD and cannot be uh, you know, laid horizontally, is that we have to use a semi-sitting position for the patient. So that also puts a strain on us because we have to work sometimes standing up. We have to lean to the side to be able to see what we're doing. So when you schedule appointments with your dentist, you want to talk about this a little later in the presentation, but you have to find that a time that is good for you and a time that is good for your dentist too. Because we have to book your time, even if we're doing a simple filling, we have to book longer time than we will take to do it on our regular patients because we have to you know, accommodate to your condition. Uh, you can have um, false aids to help you um, floss your teeth. And when we take impressions of your teeth for to make an eye guard, to make a, a removable denture or whatever it may be, we have to modify those techniques because your mouth cannot open too wide. The trays that we use to take impressions are big. So sometimes we have to modify those trays or so we have to use you know, half a tray and half a tray so we have to, you know, work our way around your, your condition to be able to uh, provide treatment for you. You can go to the next um, one. Let's see, are you going to talk about the Therabyte Nora stretcher? Would you like to? Okay, so um, in the uh, pamphlet that you can get that shows you uh, some very good um, exercises for your mouth, you'll see that you're using your hands and you're using mouth, uh, tongue depressor blades to open your mouth. But sometimes it's hard for people to do that for different reasons, maybe because they have sclerodactyly. Sometimes they need help from someone to do this. So there are these devices called Therabyte and Aura Stretch that your physician may order for you. It does require a prescription, both of these devices. They require replacement parts that you have to pay out of pocket for. Insurance pays for the device itself, but it's medical insurance that pays for that, not dental insurance. And these are uh, these exercises and these the exercises that you do with these devices are moderately effective ways to either maintain or improve your mouth opening. Now, last year I had my daughter with me, uh, a dental hygiene student who's recently graduated from dental hygiene school. She wasn't available today because she just got married yesterday. And uh, she talked about adaptive toothbrushes. These are a couple of adaptive toothbrushes that I know about. One is the Dext brush. The Dext brush seems to be a good device for people who have rheumatoid arthritis and have trouble holding a standard toothbrush handle. But unfortunately, because of the size of it, it does not work very well for someone who has scleroderma and microstomia or small mouth. The Benefit Plus toothbrush is available online. This is actually three toothbrushes, three separate handles held together by a rubber sleeve. So it's a little thicker and easier to hold. And it brushes the cheek side, the tongue side, and the biting surface of the tooth all at once. Some people may find this good. My personal favorite is to use a rechargeable electric toothbrush. 
Uh, once again, I don't have any sort of a financial agreement with these companies, but Philips Sonicare makes a very nice product and uh, so does Oral-B. Use their smaller heads, their smaller brush heads, not the larger ones that you might see in this picture. And, uh, and please ask your dentist or your dental hygienist to go over with you how you should use a power toothbrush because you use it differently from a manual toothbrush. When flossing is a problem, there are things available such as super floss, which is a, it has three different parts. It has a thin bit of floss, it has a thicker floss and it has a stiff end. This is probably not something that will work well for you if you have sclerodactyly. The, um, middle device is called a reach access flosser. It's made by the reach toothbrush company. It's basically a toothbrush handle with snap in floss bows. This is a very effective device. It's relatively easy to hold on to, and you can always increase the size of the handle by wrapping it with duct tape. And then there's the water pick flosser, which is an electronic device that uses a thin uh, plastic tip, a rubbery plastic tip to insert in between your teeth and you push a button and it vibrates the teeth, the, the tip in between your teeth. Uh, whereas the reach access flosser is available in just about any pharmacy, the water pick flosser is less available now, but you can find it pretty easily online and make sure that you use the water pick flosser not the water pick because spraying the water in between your teeth while it's more effective than not doing anything is not as effective as mechanical removal of that plaque that Dr. Del Castillo spoke of earlier. It's one of the most common uh, findings that we see in scleroderma patients is what is called external root resorption. Uh, it may affect one teeth, it may affect several teeth, I'm going to show you a couple of cases. And diagnosis can be very difficult. This uh, condition is also very common uh, after trauma. Not necessarily as a patient, but it's very common after trauma. Uh, say, for instance, you know, you don't have scleroderma and um, you fell off the bike and you hit your front teeth and you ended up having root canals, but the teeth are still there. It's very common that after years, maybe even after months, or maybe sometimes after years, we don't really know, we can really tell. But it's very common to have an external root resorption years after the, uh, the accident. And that condition is very common in scleroderma. What it is, is it's almost as if you're getting the root decay. It's almost as if the tooth starts to eat itself. It can be external, like it says here, it can also be internal. So it, it starts to eat itself from the inside out. And um, sometimes treating it is, is unsuccessful. It can be very rapidly progressive. It can be very slow progressive. So if it's slow progressive, it's actually better, uh, easier to treat, but it's very hard to tell how quickly it's gonna, it's gonna evolve. And if that happens, most of the times we cannot do anything. We have to extract and we could have to consider how to replace the teeth. Now, um, you can see here images of external root resorption. And um, you can see the, on the uh, drawing, uh, what is the internal one, which is inside the tooth starts to eat itself from inside out. And the external is from outside in, like you see in the second, second drawing. The x-ray shows, you could go back one second from the The x-ray shows an external root resorption and um, that tooth that you can see the white inside of it. Thank you. So that uh, white inside the tooth indicates a root canal. This tooth had a root canal. And if you see the shadow around it, right in the middle of the tooth, that right there, that uh, is external root resorption. So this patient had a trauma at some point in this patient's life, had the root canal done. And then years later, develop external root resources. Then this tooth has to be extracted and, and find a way to replace it. In this patient, I think we use a, a single implant. I think every dentist has had patients with uh, this same condition. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 
So how do we find out uh, if this condition is happening or any other condition in the mouth? We use x-rays. So there's two types of x-rays that are very common in dentistry. One of them is a panoramic x-ray, which you can see here. And this x-ray is taken with a machine that spins around your head. For sclerogramma patients, this is a very good x-ray to use because we don't have to go inside your mouth. The problem with this x-ray, well, this x-ray will show an overall view of your whole mouth. The problem with this x-ray is that it's not very accurate. Although the more recent ones we are now digital have a much higher level of accuracy, but still we're looking at a three-dimensional object in one plane. So there's, and also sometimes the spine gets in the way. So it has a lot of, uh, of, um, of artifacts talking between the image that is very, makes it difficult for us to diagnose, but it's better than not having anything. And like I said, the newer ones are much more accurate. So it's much more easier to diagnose. So if you have a small mouth open, if you have microstomia, this will be a good x-ray to take because we don't have to go inside your mouth. The other type of x-ray is called what's called a periapical x-ray, which is a very common x-ray that probably most of you already had, which we go in the mouth with a sensor. Now it's digital, before it was film, and we line up the x-ray machine and we take individual images of the teeth. As you can see here, this is the composition of all the images. This particular patient also had external root distortion, where you can see there, that shadow in the middle of the tooth. And um, nothing else is going on in this patient's mouth. But um, if you have microstomia, this is a very difficult x-ray to take in your mouth because you have to you know, put the sensor in your mouth, have you bite down on it. And the sensor is actually, it's about the same size as a, as a normal periapical film. It's a little bit thicker. so. Microstoma is going to make a challenge uh, taking x-rays using um, a periapical um, system. Now you can go to the next out. This is a set of x-rays of a scleroderma patient. And if you can see, she, this patient had some root canal, one root canal right there. The white inside the tooth indicates a root canal. The white on the teeth indicates silver fillings. The white in the front, lower front teeth, it's a, it's a splint that a dentist placed, a metal splint that the dentist placed to try to hold the teeth in place. And you can see, for instance, in the middle of those front teeth, <clears throat> those teeth had external root distortion. So you can see that the roots are not, doesn't look really formed. It looks like they're shortened. So the dentist, the previous dentist placed that metal splint to try to hold the teeth in place. So what we have to do, we have to find ways to try to save your teeth as much as we can. If you go to the next slide, you can see in more detail. Um, the picture on the left shows you the external root distortion on this molar. And you can see that it reached all the way down toward the nervous. Now at this point, you may ask, say, well, if it reached the nerve, how come the patient didn't feel anything? Most of the times the nerve will be already dead in this condition, so you're not gonna feel a thing. And so you can see that this tooth we cannot really restore. So in some situations, we have to try to maintain, even if there's no, um, no symptoms, no, no uh, pain, we try to you know, clean this tooth as much as we can and, and try to patch it as best as we can, um, considering also the microstomia uh, factor, to try to maintain the teeth as much as we can. You can see also, external root resorption going on on all the teeth. There's root tip remaining on the, that right there is a root tip, which um, I don't think we need to extract. We only extract it if it's showing signs of, a, of an abscess or any type of um, chronic inflammation happening, then we'll extract it. If you go to the next. Okay, so this is another patient. <clears throat> so this patient also has microstomia. And initially, this patient came to me to replace the two crowns on the, uh, the x-ray uh, on the far left, the two, those two, those two premolars. Uh, I replace those crowns. The next x-ray shows when I tried in the crowns. But if you look at, let's focus on the tooth in the middle. Looking at the first x-ray on the back side of the tooth, it doesn't really show much. But on the second x-ray, you can see like a little C-shaped um, lesion there. And 
that's is either ca a cavity or external root resorption. At this point, it's very hard to tell because it's in between the teeth. This patient cannot open the mouth too much. So I thought, that, okay, this is decay. So I treated it as decay. And I did a silver filling on the tooth, which you can see in the next tooth. But now if you look at the next tooth over, you can see the shadow there. And this external root resorption, I believe this is external root resorption, just bombed out within a matter of month. And that tooth has to be extracted. So this happened between, within months. And this is so far back in the mouth. This is a, a closer view of, a, of each. Um, now, the reason I changed those crowns, this is a picture of initially the crowns that the patient had before. And if you can see the white around the tooth, that's a, um, the metal structure. That, these crowns are made of, uh, have a metal structure and then has porcelain on top. The white that you see there is a metal. And you can see that where the metal ends and the tooth starts, there's a gap right there. And there's a gap on the next crown over too. So those crowns are not fitting up against the tooth good enough. That's the reason I had to replace those crowns. The white that you see inside the teeth, that indicates that the patient had a root canal and then had a post put in to rebuild the tooth. So that's why you see the white inside. So I, that's the crowns I replaced. If you go to the next, it's, a, it's essentially the same, same slide, but you can see now more in detail how that lesion started to develop. And then the next slide is the one that you saw. Where, and if you see carefully on the filling that I did, there's also a shadow around it. So most likely this is also external root resorption that just kept going. And uh, at some point, this tooth is gonna have to be extracted. So at, at this point, I'm just maintaining as best as I can. And, and you know, think of it uh, when we're trying to re restore these teeth, we have to go in between the teeth and up closer to the gum as far as we can go, you know, cleaning out all the decay. So this is, we're talking about an upper tooth on a patient that we cannot really put the chair completely horizontal. So it's a struggle to get there. And we don't wanna drill way too much because we don't wanna reach all the way to where the bone is, but we wanna try to keep clean as, as much as possible. So it's very common to see, you know, some sometimes some decay remaining or the, the root resorption progressing because for us it's very 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 difficult to get back there we do our best that we can to treat it but sometimes it, it, it's not enough and unfortunately because of the situation there's only so much that we can do so my point is that um, try to be patient with your dentist your dentist may get frustrated treating you. And it's not because of you, it's, it's because it's, it's very difficult. So that's why I, I want you to be patient with your dentist and your dentist, they, dentists have to be patient with you too. And, and book longer appointments. It may not take as long as necessary, but it's better to have the extra time to, uh, to treat it. This is the same patient on the other side and you can see the lesions there. These lesions are already treated, uh, but it shows you how much, how quick this um, condition could happen. Oh, so I'm going to talk about a case right now of external resorption and then talk about the pathology for this external resorption. So a gentleman came to see me, he was in his 50s, uh, about 53, and he had uh, a recent diagnosis of scleroderma about two years before. And he said that he was told that he should have his teeth checked out, although he felt that his teeth were all in great condition. And I did examine all of his teeth. I took uh, dental x-rays of all of his teeth and I found one single issue, this area of external resorption, which is underneath the, underneath the gum. And I saw this as an opportunity, both to help the patient and also to get a little information. So I, uh, what I'm showing you here is this is how deep down under the gum this area is. So it's down there. It, it starts just below the height of the gingiva here and goes down to there. So this equals the tip of the probe. I peeled back the gingiva there, the gum, 
and you can see this tissue sticking out of the root of the tooth. I scoop the tissue away and I put in a filling and sewed the gum back over it. One of my friends, a gum specialist, said that I did a terrible job sewing it back. I promised him I would do better the next time. And let me, let me ask, sir, Dave, yes. Let me ask you your experience. Because yes. I, the patients that I've seen with scleroderma that have external root resorption are usually the ones that have most of the, uh, the sclerodactyly and the microstomia. Mm -hmm. The people that have scleroderma that I've seen that don't, you can already tell that they have scleroderma I usually don't have external root resorption. Is that common? Mm -hmm. Is that, is that well, the case? I agree with you, but in this case, this gentleman was, uh, he seemed in very good health and he, and I wasn't really clear on how the diagnosis of scleroderma was affecting him. So he was some, one of my patients who was actually in very good health and, uh, and had very little uh, problems with, uh, he had no microstomia. His hands seemed to be in uh, pretty good shape, a little bit stiff, and uh, and he didn't have the tightness in his face yeah. that you often see. Um, anyway, I sent that piece of tissue, of uh, the biopsy, to uh, Dr. John Garlic, who is also a oral pathologist, and he and one of his uh, postdocs made microscope slides of it. So this is a slide of that tissue. And under high magnification, what they found was they called it phagocytic macrophages formed, uh, forming multinucleated giant cells. And these were the cells that were eating away at the tooth. These are also the same kind of cells that would eat away at bone if you have osteolysis, which is very common in the angle of the mandible. It's also common in the bone that holds the teeth in place. It's, it's less common, but it can also happen in the jaw joint, the TMJ, which we'll talk about in a minute. Under high magnification, you could see this is a little tiny piece of dentin within this tissue that these cells sort of ate away from the tooth. So dentin is the hard inner part of the tooth, not the enamel. And there's a little piece of it stuck in this tissue. The issue that I see with patients who have uh, internal and external resorption of teeth is very often, and I've been seeing this for about 15 years, Dentists will get caught up on trying to save a tooth that has external or internal resorption that is very questionable. Like yeah. in the best of circumstances, maybe you could save it. And you spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and, and money on saving a tooth that will continue to resorb. Yeah. So it's very important for uh, dentists who are recommending treatment to be aware of this issue and what can happen. And by the way, many times I've seen that when dentists provide endodontic treatment to a tooth that has internal resorption, people who have scleroderma, the tooth continues to resorb. Oh yes. And I've tried uh, restoring external resorptions and found that they continue to resorb. It's not that I think that there's no sense in doing that. I'm sure that it slows the loss of the tooth, but it's not a long-term fix. It would be interesting to know if um, the silver diamide right. would work. You know? Yeah, that, uh, and that's something that maybe you and I can try. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the recommendations for external resorption, it's more common with scleroderma, may affect one or several teeth. Uh, diagnosis can be difficult. Um, Dr. Del Castillo and I would be happy to, uh, to talk with any of your dentists about, uh, about a particular case if they want to send us images. Um, treat, uh, treatment is often unsuccessful and we should consider replacing the teeth. Uh, Dr. Del Castillo, implants. Yes. So if we're replacing teeth, implants is a very common um, uh, you know, resource. 
Usually there's no contraindications to treat scleroderma patients with implants. One thing to consider is what Dr. Lido mentioned is um, the osteolysis. So if you have, if you have bone loss um, of that condition where the bone is being eating away, uh, then implants may not be the option for you. Now, um, each case is completely different, whether you have scleroderma or not. Uh, some people get caught up with some type of advertisements that they say, oh, we can do your implants and, uh, and um, teeth in a day and you, you get your teeth in one day and blah, blah, blah. That works, but that's not for everybody. So your case have to be you know, carefully evaluated to find out exactly how much bone you have. Because in some conditions, for instance, on the mandible, uh, sometimes we don't have enough bone. Sometimes we do have enough bone, but there's a nerve that goes around the, the uh, gel bone that we have to know where that nerve is. Because when you're replacing implants, essentially we're drilling a hole in your bone to place the implants. If we're doing it in the, body, in the mandible, we need to know where that nerve is because you don't want to drill a hole in your bone and hit the nerve. If we do that, then you're going to end up with numbness in that part of your mouth for the rest of your life. So we have to care, very carefully evaluate each patient, whether it has scleroderma or not, uh, to know exactly where the, the topography of the bone, where we're gonna place the implant. In the mandible, how much bone we have, how much volume, height and width, where the nerve is located. For the maxilla, we have to know, especially in the back of the mouth, Right underneath the roots of the molars, we have the sinuses, which are empty cavities. It, usually when we lose the back teeth, that bone resorts and gets closer to the bottom of that sinus. So usually there's not enough thickness of bone in that area. Now that doesn't mean that you cannot have implants. You can have implants if we do a procedure called sinus lift, when we fill the bottom portion of the sinus with bone. Now this is a much more involved uh, procedure if you have scleroderma and you have microsomia, it may not be the option to go for. Um, microsomia is a big factor to consider uh, dealing with implants because we have to use hand pieces to drill in the bone. Those hand pieces are usually larger than the ones we use to um, treat cavities. And um, so if we're trying to place an implant on a molar, whether it's the upper the maxilla or the mandible, and you cannot really open your mouth too much, it's, it's gonna be very, very hard to do. Not only placing the implants, but we're going to restore it. We use very, very small screws and we need to be able to reach where that implant is. With microstomia, it's almost impossible. So having scleroderma doesn't preclude you from getting implants, but microstomia is a really, really big factor. Now, if you see the picture on the uh, bottom left side, that represents an implant in the bone and the crown goes in. We can have crowns that go, those crowns are usually held by a screw. And um, if this implant is placed right in the middle of the tooth, like the drawing shows, and sometimes that implant ends up in a slightly angled position. So we have to use a, a device to change that angulation and be able to put the crown in, which is the, which are the two pictures that you see in the middle. Those, this patient didn't have the lateral incisors. So we place two implants and we attach a component that changed the angulation of that implant. And now we can put crowns that are cemented onto those implants. So that's the picture on the top, shows the patient with the crowns in the mouth. And you can see that it looks like the patient doesn't even have any teeth missing. But again, it's um, we can place implants a patient with scleroderma, but we have to carefully evaluate each case. We have to carefully evaluate whether you have scleroderma or not. Uh, each case is different. Uh, once the implant goes in, we have to wait for a, a certain amount of time for the bone to grow and integrate with the implant. Sometimes we can do what is called immediate placement, which when we extract the tooth and we place the implant at the same time, sometimes we do what is called immediate loading which is when we place the implant and we put a crown immediately right after the surgery. Um, we didn't do that before. Nowadays, we're doing it more often because we're getting a much more a consistent result, much better result nowadays. But again, it, everything has to be carefully evaluated. Each case is particular. 
So even though you have scleroderma, you can still get implants, but again, microstomia, big, big, big factor. I have two questions about this. So one of my concerns with scleroderma is uh, where patients lose teeth because of osteolysis. Yes. So you lose a tooth because of because the bone is getting eaten away by these macrophages, uh, does that uh, make us more concerned about placing? Oh, yeah, them? absolutely, absolutely. Because if, if, if patient is already losing bone, then, then you know, if we place implant, that's not gonna stop. And so then we have to consider a different you know, alternative in terms of restoring. And similarly, patients who uh, are taking a bisphosphonate medication, yes. like Simex or or uh, deep or not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things before uh, we close the talk. First of all, um, I've become involved with a group called SPIN, the Scleroderma Patient Centered Intervention Network. Uh, there's a whole lot of information on this slide. You're going to be able to get a PDF of all of our slides and you can read this, but this is a group of researchers based in Canada, but there are researchers all over the country involved with them, including Dan First, and um, patients all over the world are involved in this group. Once every few months, so three or four times a year, they send long questionnaires out to patients who have scleroderma to ask them about their experiences with uh, the condition, with the disease, and right now, they're working on a questionnaire for oral health. And we've been working on something called a scoping review where we collect all the information available on oral health issues and scleroderma. So if you are interested in, in being involved in research where you don't actually have to go somewhere to have people poke and prod you, you just fill out a questionnaire, then please sign up with spinsclero.com slash en slash cohort. Let's see, also one other thing, um, something that I became aware of a few years ago is that a very small number of scleroderma patients develop osteolysis in the jaw joint, in the TMJ. And I'm holding my hands up to my ears because this is where the jaw joint is. So as you open and close, you can feel it moving. The picture on the left shows a, uh, a patient. This is a 3D image of a patient who has lost the part of the jaw joint that makes up the jaw part of this, of this uh, joint. And on the right side, you see what a normal jaw joint looks like. In the case of the patient in this paper, and by the way, she came and found me at a scleroderma meeting several years ago and gave me a copy of this paper so I would know about her case. The uh, surgeons were able to work together to create a, uh, a computer um, manufactured replacement for the joint, the part of the joint that is part of the skull and the part of the joint that is the part of the, of the mandible or the lower jaw. The part that's uh, attached to the skull is made of a type of plastic and the type that's the, and the uh, device that's part of the jaw now is made of titanium metal. This was a very effective treatment for her. You can see here's the metal, here's how it's uh, screwed into the, into the angle of her mandible, into the jawbone. Uh, this gave her full function back and also improved her microstomia. Interesting. Yeah, we had a case like this at Tufts a few years ago. Unfortunately, the patient passed before we could get to it. But in her case, the fossa or the part of the uh, TMJ that was under, that's part of the skull, had been eaten away so much that there was a hole through to the inside of the skull oh, wow. in that area. And 
in that case, uh, our friend, Dr. Lascarides had to call in a, uh, a neurologist to a neurosurgeon to consult on the possibility or what we would have to do to replace this part of the jaw joint. Unfortunately, we never had the opportunity to do that. Mm. I've heard of maybe a half dozen other scleroderma patients who had a similar issue. But if any of you have an issue like this, I do wish that you'd be in touch with me so that I can find out what you're doing for that and, uh, and if your treatments are any improvement like they were for this patient. And just a before and after picture. On the left is before she replaced her TMJ, her, the jaw joint. And on the right, you can see the improvement in her jawline, in her chin afterwards was amazing. Finding a dentist, many dentists have training to work with autoimmunity. Students at many dental schools rotate through special care clinics, including our students at Tufts and the students at BU. Uh, there are oral medicine and public health dentists who, uh, these are specialists with extensive training in working with patients who have chronic illness. General practice residencies and advanced education in general dentistry <coughs> offer additional training after dental school. They have clinics at hospitals and at dental schools where they see patients who have chronic illnesses. You can go to uh, the special care dentistry online or so scdaonline.org website and they have a find a dentist um, page on this website. If you have a dental school near where you live, or maybe even not so near, you can get in touch with their oral medicine department and they will have oral medicine specialists who can help you. Tertiary care hospitals will often have a dental clinic. And you can also email me and email Dr. Del Castillo and we'll be happy to, uh, if possible, help you find a dentist or if you have a dentist that you really like to work with and they just need some advice on how to work with you since you have scleroderma and uh, many dentists are nervous about causing harm by treating people that where we don't understand the condition. In a case like that, we're happy to talk with them. Absolutely. And and see if we can, uh, can help educate them. I think everything I know about scleroderma, I can explain to a dentist in about 20 minutes. Uh, here's the summary. Tell your dentist you have scleroderma and how it affects you. Annual x-ray imaging is very important for prevention. Bring your list of medications and your physicians to your dentist. We're very interested to know this stuff. We need to know this information to treat you. Schedule the best time of day for you and for your dentist for your treatments. I'll give you an example. My office staff, uh, when I was practicing in, in my solo practice regularly every day, they knew that I hated doing root canal treatment in the evening hours. But for a scleroderma patient, if that was the best time of day for them, I would sleep later in the morning and come in a little later and I would take care of them at the best time of day for them. But also as Dr. Del Castillo said, please take pity on us. We're wearing, uh, we're wearing a lot of heavy gear. Sometimes we have to stand in uncomfortable positions to treat you. And- um, Yeah, do... like for instance, uh, sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. In our schedule, for instance, if we're gonna see a scleroderma patient say in the afternoon, and we have a big case in the morning, then you know we're gonna be burned out by the middle of the day. And then if you're really burned out and you're gonna treat another case that is really, really gonna take a toll on you, that's why what, what, what we mean by you know the best time for you and your dentist too. So you know, usually our staff are prepared to handle and arrange the schedule in a way that when a scheduled patient is coming, that we don't book anything very major afterwards or even major before, so that we have you know, the stamina and the strength to treat you well. Right. Now, I know you also have a couple of daughters, so you're pretty much burned out all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, do your, your exercises, your physical therapy to 
uh, on your mouth stretching exercises right before your dental appointment, maybe even while you're sitting in the waiting room, or maybe while you're sitting in the operatory if, if you would like to have some privacy. When you come to our practices, please bring gloves, bring a blanket, let the dental staff know if the air conditioning is a problem for you. My staff, because we, we used to see a lot of patients who have scleroderma in my solo practice, they would know who our scleroderma patients were and they would turn off the air conditioning immediately when one of them would walk in the office so that, you, so that they wouldn't have problems with rain ons. And we did have blankets available, but not every dentist will have that. Remember orthodontics and dental implants are often okay, but it is on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, orthodontics it would be the same as, as dental implants, you know, depending on the macrostomia, uh, you know, you may be able to have orthodontic treatment or probably not. Right, and also depending on osteolysis. Osteolysis too, yeah. The other thing also that is worth mentioning is that, you know, in terms of your dental care, your dentist and your hygienist are your best friends. So if you have um, sclerodactyly, then uh, you know work with your dentist and your hygienist to show you what's the best way for you to clean your teeth. Yes. Maybe bring your toothbrush to the office, and then you know the hygienist and the dentist are going to show you, you know, if you're doing anything wrong, how to change your approach in terms of trying to keep your mouth as clean as possible. Absolutely, hundred um, percent. Your medical team will want to know. Uh, uh, we'll want to know that your medical team is working to diagnose and treat dry mouth. Um, unfortunately, many physicians don't realize that this is an issue. If your dentist mentions to you that you're having problems with dry mouth, please bring it up with your physician. They may be able to adjust your medication. They may be able to prescribe a muscarinic agonist for you. Uh, diagnose and treat GERD gastroesophageal reflux disease aggressively, watch for side effects of medication that may affect your oral health and discuss that with your physician and your pharmacist. Uh, your physician can prescribe physical and occupational therapy for you that would then be covered by your medical insurance. Dentists, if we prescribe physical or occupational therapy, uh, medical insurance is not going to cover it. And also hopefully your medical team is referring new patients to dentists. And remember, uh, you can ask them to help you with your medication lists and, and whatever recommendations they may have. Uh, Dr. Del Castillo and my daughter, Allison Leader, and, uh, and a couple of other people work together to produce the updated Scleroderma Oral Health Brochure, which will be available shortly for free download from scleroderma.org. This just has uh, some very basic information for you and your dentist and your physician. And here's our contact information. The information also for scleroderma, I'm sorry, not scleroderma, for special care dentistry online and the SPIN scleroderma cohort. And, uh, Dr. Del Castillo, it was a pleasure presenting with you. Thank you. Likewise. Same here. Same here. Always a pleasure to see you. Thank you.